Here he comes. Whoa! Nice fish. You see how fast he come up out of the water? Whoa! Woo! Look at him come. There he comes. There he comes. Where's he at? There he is. Boy, that was a deep fish, folks. Another good fish. About 35 foot over 45. Got to let him go right away so he can get back home and I'll catch him next year. He's coming straight up. Coming straight up. He's coming straight up. That's what you got to watch about these doodle fish. Up they come. Nice lake meat keeper. Oh, nice fish. Nice fish, folks. So here we are today at beautiful Lake Mead in southern Nevada. We're in an area of, called Echo Bay. Echo Bay is the gateway to the Overton Arm. It's one of the areas that have the bigger fish in the lake. They're extremely difficult to catch. They're spooky. Uh, this is a real clear, deep water lake. Uh, the techniques that I'm going to apply today will apply to any lake in a country that is deep and clear. I want to say that this is December. It's extremely cold, uh, windy, and blustery. So if we can catch some fish today, I think we can prove something. Thank you. Before we start fishing at Lake Mead, I'm going to show you how I rig my baits, my worms, my sinkers, my hooks, everything from A to Z. The first thing I do is I use six pound test Trilene XT Clear. I think it's really good line and I use it a lot. Then I use a 316 sinker and I use the red one. And then I use a red faceted glass bead. The bead must be glass and it must be faceted. I like to use a Gary Klein weapon hook, a one-aught for the straight worm, and a two-aught for the paddle tail. The reason I like to use these particular hooks because they have a perfect wide gap, and they're, on, they're the only needlepoint hooks on the market today. First, the sinker. Then the bead. like so. And now we'll tie the knot. I like to use a double palomar. I'll run it in once, run it in twice, so you have two strands of line through the eye of the hook, like so. I'll make one loop and pull snug, not real tight, just snug, like so. And I'll run the hook through the eye of the loop. Pull with the short end only, folks. Don't pull with the long end because you'll fracture the line. See what happens? You don't care about that because you're going to cut it off. You pull with the long line, you're going to have the line fractured a little bit. 
Then I'll use it. We're going to use a straight tail worm. It's going to be a new liver worm that I just developed. Take the hook and put it through the flat side of the worm in about an eighth of an inch. Pull it all the way through, like so. Take a flat toothpick. Insert it through the eye of the hook and out the other end into the worm. So don't pull down. Trim it. Take and lift the worm up and in a couple times to form a track to the side of the worm. And there you have the proper rigging. Now that we're all rigged, we'll, we'll double back on this a little bit now. 3 16 sinker, red faceted bead, glass, not plastic, a one aught Gary Klein weapon hook, flat toothpick, and a four and a half inch straight worm. When you're dealing with the paddle tail, the only thing you're doing different in the rigging is you use a two aught weapon hook or a two hot hook of any kind instead of a one eye because you got a little more rubber to penetrate in the paddle tail. Two aught for the paddle tail, one aught for the straight. We're all ready to go fishing now. What we got here is typical good lake mead structure. We have the broken rock and in the nothing bank, there's a lot of banks on Lake Mead that are real barren looking. I mean, they just don't look like nothing, but there are deep walls next to them with the deep water. And as you look across the banks, all of a sudden you see this one little isolated rock slide, and it has the deep water in front of it. That's a prime area to hold a few bass. Let's, let's hope something happens here. It's about 35 foot of water coming out to 40. We're in 40 now. I'm going to back off a little bit more and let a little bit more line out. 45. These rocks will come out pretty deep here, and it's really cold. Shake. There he is. There he is. I got him. He's coming up now. He's coming up fast. You got to keep up with the slack, otherwise they'll come off. Here he comes. Okay, up he comes. These lake meat fish are hot. There he comes. Nice keeper fish. There he comes. Well, that's how it's done. I was lucky that time. Let's hope we can do that all day today. There's the fish. There's a nice lake meat keeper. Real nice lake meat keeper. Now, I'm going to let them go now because you, when you get these fish in the deep water like this, you're gonna have, you cannot keep them out of the water long. If you let them go right away, they'll go right back down. So I'm going to let the little baby go and hope I catch them in the U.S. Open. Take off, baby. I caught that fish at about 45 foot, right? Just the way I said it. The way I was talking about the little rock slide and, and the nothing bank and the deep water. And I was letting the line out from 30 to 35 to 40 to 45, and then he took it. And I was shaking. When I shake, I shake with my left hand against the palm, my thumb on the line. I shake with the right hand and let the thumb act as a trigger for the line. That line gets tight for any reason or dies, I'll set the hook. I'm either stuck or it's a fish, especially in the winter time. Your bites are real subtle. They're, they're just like a rubber band. You pull a rubber band, that's what you're feeling down there. You're not going to get that real heavy thunk in 45 foot of water with six pound test line and a 316 sinker. That's what we're using. Caught that fish on one of my liver worms, which is kind of a reddish, uh, purplish red cinnamon worm. It works really good in this real deep, clear water like it is right now. I shake with my right, up, 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 up. Try to keep the tip as close as I can to the water, preferably at about 24 inches. I'm shaking and I'll stop. In the wintertime, you gotta slow everything down. Shake, pull, stop, shake, 
Then I'll let it stop a minute, just let it sit there, give them a chance to look at it, and I'll pull it just a little bit. And I'll start shaking again. Bop, 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 bop. And I'll stop. And I'll pull. You remember in the winter it's cold. Fish get slower, their metabolism is slower. It takes them a little longer to look at that bait and grab it. But if you irritate him enough, and he wants it, just like that last fish I caught, he'll get it. Normally there's only about one one fish on a spot like this, especially in the winter. But the way we're fishing right now, you could catch these fish at Lake Mead or any deep clear water lake all year, not necessarily the winter. Winter is really the toughest time because they're not as aggressive. The type of reel I like to use, there's two kinds. 3500C, made by Ambassador, is one of the finest light tackle reels made. Very free spooling, very easy to cast, and it's designed for light line. The only disadvantage you have with this reel is retrieving the fish or retrieving the line back. When you, when you stick a doodle fish, the fish will come straight up and you have to keep off with them. So you have to reel fast. There's nothing you can do about it. For one disadvantage, it has many advantages. I like the palming cup for when I hold it when I'm doodling. I like everything about the reel, plus it was designed for light tackle fishing. The other reel I like to use is a 2500C. It's, it's just as good as a 35. It's just a little harder to get. Uh, it's still designed specifically for light line fishing. I really like the reel too. If you can't get one, get the other. Uh, the reason these reels work so well, first of all, they're light, they're free spooled, and there's no mags involved, so it gives you a good control. Plus, they're designed for light tackle, light line fishing, and the line don't get caught in the spools. It has one disadvantage. Again, I'll reiterate the fact that you got to retrieve rape, which is very slow. You just have to use your hand. For every advantage, again, there's, there's, there's only one disadvantage. Then I like to use the Phoenix Boron Rod, which is a Don Ivino doodle rod. It's manufactured in Anaheim, California by the Phoenix Rod Company for me. It's designed specifically for doodling. It has a fast tip and a, lot, and a real strong butt end. Very light, very sensitive. Has a little foregrip here. That you can put your hand on when you're doodling and your line, line feed against your thumb, like so. Uh, this is boron. It also has SIC guides, which I like for light, light lines because the line, if you get a good fish, it won't burn and cause it to break. SIC is probably one of the best guides you can use. That's about the whole thing now. We've talked about the uh, worms, the sinkers, the hooks, how to rig it, the type of reels I use, type of rods I use, the people who make this particular equipment. This also, I have a, two doodling kits. I have a doodling kit with the straight tails, and I have a doodling kit with the paddle tails. One is called an S kit, one is called a P kit. The only difference between the two is one's paddle, one's straight, one has a one-odd hook, and one has a two-odd hook. One of the, my favorite little tricks here, I use a freezer bag which is a strong, heavy-duty bag, and I'll pour my fish formula in there. I use fish formula crawfish sparkle. I really like it, especially with these worms of mine. I'll put the worm sinker bead and everything in there and shake it around, and as you can see, it really gets on everything this way. Instead of squirting it all over your boat and the water and everything else, and this way you can really get good penetration. And I'll take it out and lift it up over the side. I'll take the little baggie. It works real good. To make it convenient, take one of these fish for, uh, rod saver straps and just put it down on there like so. Lift it up over like so. Like that. It ain't going nowhere. It keeps it up front with you. And this way you've got good scent on the sinker, the hook, the bead, the line, everything. And you haven't squirted it all over the boat and the water and it looks like an oil slick. Somebody's sinking. It's very important, I believe, in, the, in using the sand, especially in deep water like this. Uh, when you're shaking it down there, you're shaking that sparkle off. You're shaking that scent. You're, you're just getting their attention. And between the bead making the noise, the sinker bouncing, and the worm jumping, if there's a bass down there, he's going to eat it.
Let's take it a little farther and use an aquarium to assimilate it so you can see it more clearly. What we have here is a bag. We'll shake the worm, sinker, and bait into fish formula and drop it in the aquarium and start shaking it. And as you can see, when you get down into the water, what will happen with those sparkles? They'll start coming off. And this will entice the fish to eat. It makes it look real and it gives it a little bit of scent and along with the noise and the natural color of the crawdads and the sinker and everything, the fish will eat it. Now as you keep shaking it, you can see what's happening there. The tail looks just like a crawdad's tail. The bead's making the noise of a crawdad clicking his tail. We're coming up on a typical lake meat point, a nothing looking, round looking point. But this particular point has a lot of deep water right next to it. And if you look right on the point there, you'll see a little tiny kind of a rock formation right there. Well, that'll kind of give you an idea that there's some broken rock that follows down into the deeper water. Again, you have to have that broken rock. Rocks and boulders on these deep clear water lakes are extremely important. So what we're going to do now is move off this point very slowly, into the, just like we did the other spot, and work the worm down to about 45 foot of water. Again, I'll stay on a spot between 10 and 15 minutes and work it thoroughly uh, if I really have confidence. Now this, again, we're in the winter time. It's extremely cold. Fish are deep and slow. If you can catch one or two fish, in an area or one fish a spot, you know, that's all it's going to take, especially when nobody else is catching nothing. But you have to be balanced, you have to use everything. The right line, the right sinkers, the right hooks, everything that I'm doing, and the right formation, fish in a clear water lake. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to position the boat just off these broken rocks, again, that, are, that you cannot see. And the only way you can find rocks like this is use your graph recorder or your meter, or the water's so darn clear you could just roll up on it and look. And that's how, that's how I found this particular spot. Like now, the water, you can look at this water right now, and at 35 foot you can see the bottom. And you can see how the rock formation falls down. Well, what I want to do now is throw past that rock formation in 35 or 40 foot of water. This is about what it is there. And again, I'm peeling the line out. You see how I do that? Because if you just engage the reel automatically, especially in deep water, your line is going to pendulum right straight down. I want it to go drop straight down past the target so I can shake it and pull it past the target. What we're doing now is, like I said, I just threw the bait past the target, let the line out, peel it out until it goes to the bottom. Don't just engage the reel like so. Let the line go. Just let it peel. Let it move this way which is important. Then it comes to a stop, then take up the slack. Again, hold your left hand against the palm, thumb on the line, and shake with your right hand. Up, 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 stop, pull slow, take up the slack, and keep running across that boulder. Up, 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 stop, pull slow, let it sit, in the winter, I like to shake, pull, and stop, which is important. Again, I'll work, I'll work the area thoroughly. I'll try to cover this rock formation off this point for about 10 to 15 minutes. Hopefully, I get bit. If I don't, I'll move on to the next spot. Normally, you'll get bit right away once you get that worm working down there. Here he comes, about 45 foot. It's coming straight up. Coming straight up, he's coming straight up. That's what you gotta watch about these doodle fish. Up they come. Nice lake meat keeper. Oh, nice fish. Nice fish, folks. That's how it's done. December, cold, windy. They can't resist that doodle fishing. That fish come out of 45 foot of wa water. The wa just a pressure bite. You see how I approach this spot. Moved in, pushing the boat over the side of the boulder. Let the line out, then pull and shake the worm past the boulder out into the deeper water. He grabbed it, we got him, and that's great. Nice lake meat keeper. That's two now. Well, I'm gonna let this little baby go. You can't keep him out of the water very long in that deep water. See it next year, baby. Thank you. You did a good job for daddy.
Let's move the boat in a little closer and see if we can catch a suspended fish off this point on the doodle slide. Fish come on a sink doodle sliding at about 35 foot. Doodle sliding is the worm falling down at a controlled depth, shaking at a controlled angle. About 35 foot over 45. Got to let him go right away so he can get back home and I'll catch him next year. Nice good fish. Down he goes. I want to talk a little bit about this spot here that, that I've just got through catching two fish on. This particular spot is, there, there's hundreds of spots like this on Lake Mead or any deep clear water lake where you have, especially Lake Mead, these nothing looking points. You must study them. They're extremely important to study them. It doesn't take many rocks to hold a few fish, but it's got to have that real deep water next to it. That's important. Uh, today, we're catching these fish at 35 to 45 foot. The first two fish I caught, I caught Vertical doodling by shaking, pulling, and stop. Again, in the winter, you got to show that, slow that shake down to a da, 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 stop, pull. When you cast to the target, you let the line out. Do not engage the reel until it reaches the bottom. That's important. The last fish I caught, I was doodle sliding. I let the line out, but before it got to the bottom, I start shaking. And that's just like a slide in the playground where, the wor where you slide down. I do the same thing with the worm, except I'll shake it and pull it while it's falling in that deeper water, and I can control the fall of that worm. I can slow it down, and that fish grabbed it. All your bites in the winter are very, very subtle. Slow, pull pressure type bites. Anything you feel different, you swing. Swings are free. He who hesitates is lost. Well, what I want to do is, is review basically what we just did uh, in, in this last spot I just fished. I told you about the deep water, the boulder, the subtle looking point with the drop off next to it. I positioned the boat, let the line out, shook and pulled the bait across the boulder into the deep water and back again. The first fish took it about 45 foot of water. I'm using a straight tail worm that I call my doodle worms. These are the original. This is what started the whole thing years ago. This particular color is what I call my liver worm. It's one of my brand new colors and, and today it's surely working good. It's a bright high sky, very cold, very clear and they seem to really be eating it. I think if you look the camera can focus in. You can see how they have ate that worm. They have really chewed it up. Very. Now both these fish come extremely deep, and they were aggressive enough to really grab that. It's one thing about these Gary Klein weapon hooks. This is not a commercial, but it's important. It's it's true. These needle points in deep water with that wide gap really penetrate those fish good especially when these fish are coming straight up like, you, like you've like you seen on camera. Uh, we got two really good shots of when I stuck them in 45 and how they come straight up. They have to be stuck good. Um, a lot of people say, well, if you peg the worm, you can't stick the hook. That's not true. It's, it's tr only true when you're dealing with a real s big worm and it's very hard and the hook won't pull through. Then you can, it would would not be wise to peg it because you're not going to get a good hook set. But what you're dealing with here was a very lifelike, very soft worm. So when you're pulling, even though you peg it, you notice when it's pegged, that fish pulled so hard, he almost pulled the worm off when he grabbed it down there. That's how hard he bit it. And yet it was just pressure, like a rubber band. But if I hadn't had it pegged, he would have pulled it right down. But you see, it, it, it hooked, the fish got hooked good. The, the hook penetrated through the plastic good. And you can see how natural looking this worm is. I'm really excited about this new worm of mine.
We're going to head for a different area now. As you can see, Lake Mead, the, the structure almost always looks alike. You could really get confused. But if you pay attention to what I showed you and what to look for, you'll get a shot at uh, more bass than normal and most people would get, sh get a shot at. We're going to move to another spot now. We're going to come up on it, try to get in, get in a little cover where it calms down so we can uh, fish a little better. This is another area that I like to fish. You see you have a lot of walls here and there's some boulders in the water like over there. Now them boulders come out and they'll come out into this deeper water here. So what I'll try to do, and they're isolated. You have a wall, and all of a sudden you got this boulder coming out. So what I'm gonna do is position the boat, because of the winter time right now, and the summer too, I'm gonna position the boat in 35 to 45 foot of water, throw my bait out, let it go to the bottom, and then shake it back across the boulder, just like we did at the last spot. This is a little different pattern because it's off a sheer wall instead of a point. So let's give this a try now. I don't know if it's a bass or a bluegill, but he's there and I got him. Smaller fish this time. He hit it on his sink. I think it was the same fish. Oh, nice fish, nice fish. You never know when they come out of that deep water, they're big or little, as they're coming straight up. This is a nice keeper. I think it's the same one I got bit on in the last cast. He come about 30 foot over about 50. Right on the boulder. Nice fish. Nice keeper fish. Real nice keeper fish. Again, what I did was throw it on the outside of the boulder, peel the line out, let the fish watch the bait get down in that deep water, and then start shaking just before it hit the bottom. And he hit it. This was a doodle slide fish, it kind of a suspended fish. He'd come out and grab it on a sink. About 25 over 50. There might be another fish there because of the way he ate it and the way the bit the bite I just missed could be another fish there. So we'll try another try it again. Bye, baby. You guys are being good to me today. Remember, folks, this is December. It's about 50 degrees out. Cold, windy. Water temperature is 57, and this little worm is really getting eat today. But it's a subtle bait, it's a subtle technique. This is the first time I've ever put this on film, and I think you're seeing uh, all, a lot of the things that I've talked about and people have talked about and what I do really does work. You can believe it or not. Seeing is believing. It's no tricks, no gimmicks. What I've been doing is strictly legit. I have no idea when I come out today whether I could even catch fish. But I do have a lot of confidence in what I do and the baits that I use and, and the way I fish this lake and any clear deep water lake, they're all the same. I picked Lake Mead in December because it's the very toughest. I've talked to a lot of my friends before I come up, nobody's catching any fish up here. So this is when, when it gets tough, these little worms get tougher. You can call them sissy baits or anything else you want to call them, but they're fish catching little buggers, and they win a lot of money. And when fishing's tough, the tough get going. You can see here how the sinker and the worm perfectly match this crawdad, and that's what I've tried to do. A lot of people say, well, paint and sinkers don't mean nothing, but in clear water, it, it really does, and you can see how real life that is. And with that sinker jumping up and down against a bead, you can see how with the noise it's going to make, it's going to act like a crawdad's head. And you can see how close that is to the crawdad's color. And also the brown, the brown too. I take the brown one, put the brown one in there. And you see the match there is pretty good. And that's important. Every little bit helps means a difference between getting a bite and not getting a bite, then I'm going to do it. What I'm going to do now is drop that crawdad in, kind of watch, watch how he comes down and his legs are jumping a little bit. And I'm going to now take the worm, the paddle tail worm, and drop it down there and try to simulate what that crawdad's doing. 
As you can see, he's getting a little irritated. What I'm going to try to do is get him to take his tail and start working it a little bit so you can see how it simulates what the worm tail is doing. If I can make him mad enough, you can see where he'll take off and... There, there you go. There, that's what you're trying to do with the tail of the worm. Just what that crawdad did just then. You see how he took his tail and he worked it back and forth. That's how they motivate. So what you're simulating when you're doodling is with this worm is the same thing he's trying to do right there. That's really good. I'm, he's performing just like a pro. Uh, one of the problems that will happen when you're doodling is your line will twist. And I've had a lot of people ask me, what do I do when the line gets twisted? Is there anything I can do to prevent it? No. When your line is twisted, you're doing the job right. So what I like to do, you can see my line is all twisted up here. You can see how that's twisted. What I like to do then is I'll take my line and I'll cut the sinker and hook off, which is very important. And then I'll let it out behind the boat, like so. No sinker, no hook. Just let the line behind the boat and run the boat at a slow troll speed. Let the line out and drag it for four or five minutes. By doing this, it'll untwist all the line, take, take some of the stretch out and, and soften the monofilament a little bit. And you'll be ready to go again. I may do this two or three times during the day. My line twist. If I'm doodling all day, sometimes I don't doodle all day. But if I'm doodling like this time of year, I'd probably doodle all day. I would do this three or four times. So that's just a little little extra there, something that if your line is twisted, don't worry about it, you're doing it right. Cut the sinker and hook off, troll it behind the boat for four or five minutes and you're ready to go again. Uh, we're going to go in now and uh, try again tomorrow. Hopefully we have as much luck tomorrow as we did today. Today we're at Temple Bar. Temple Bar is located in the southernmost section of Lake Mead. It's also one of the most popular areas to launch your boat because of the weather. It's centrally located. To the right out of the launch ramp, you can get into the Virgin Canyon, Greg Basin, Grand Wash, Pierce Ferry, and up into the Colorado River to fish. To the left of the launch ramp, you can get into what we call the Jip Beds, Benelli Bay, and also, if you want to, if the weather's nice, up into Echo Bay, where we were fishing yesterday. Yesterday, the weather was a lot more blusterier and cold and windy. As you, as you know, we've had a quite a good day yesterday. The, the, the fish really cooperated. The doodle fish were really biting. But I could not catch any fish on the inside secondary points. We caught most of the fish on the outside main points with broken rock from 25 to 60 feet. And we've caught mo we caught almost one or two fish on about every spot we stopped, which is I'm very happy about because normally when you're doing a show like this, you, you play real havoc with you trying to catch some fish. So it worked out real well yesterday, and I think you have some idea what doodling's all about and how I go about doing it. Uh, today we're going to try to fish the same pattern, but the weather's a lot different today. We have a high sky, we have no wind, it's flat and calm. And after a front, this makes for real tough fishing. But my style of fishing usually pays off when the weather's like this. And we'll see today. And remembering now, uh, I want to make myself clear on this, that any deep, clear water lake that we fish in the country will relate to Lake Mead. So whatever I do on Lake Mead, you can try anywhere in the country. And I really feel confident that if you do this and, and fish these techniques that I showed you, that you'll do real well. I think right now, oh, one other thing I wanted to tell you was Temple Bar is in Arizona, folks. So when you're fishing Lake Mead, you have to get an Arizona and a Nevada license because Echo Bay is in Nevada and Temple Bar is in Arizona. It's something that you might want to keep in mind if you come out here. We're going to go now and see what we can get done. We're going to do a lot of grafting today, and hopefully we can locate some fish and show you how we can catch these fish when we've got a high sky and high pressure. Sure is a nice day today, folks.
I wish you were with me. This is December. You know, sometimes wishes can't come true because of the video. You can come along with me now on a bright, clear day, real calm water, and under the, probably one of the toughest conditions you can fish under, especially in the winter time. This is going to be a, the first in a series of tapes that I plan on doing on, on my style of fishing. Uh, I'm not going to get too heavy into the graph recording in this tape. I want to stick strictly to doodling and uh, fishing Lake Mead with a few graphing sequences in it. Uh, I, my plans for the future, if these are, this particular tape is successful, is to do a tape on graph recording and fishing with your graph and the meters. That's my next uh, tape to come out and then we uh, hopefully down the road, I'm going to do one on finesse fishing in the west, on split shot fishing and on Lake Mead. These are all the plans that I have for the future, and hopefully this particular tape is successful and the fishermen and the fisherwoman like it. And if they do, then I'm going to continue on with a series. This is a, an area that we took a little pan shot of to show you some more patterns to look for, this broken rock out front in the canyon here, and in the back you see a little slide, and the slide's got some deeper water, just like we talked about yesterday at Echo Bay. Not every spot's going to hold a fish, but if it's got the deeper water and a broken rock slide like we showed you in the shot there, uh, it's worth a shot. Uh, I'm going to throw out here now and see if we can catch a fish here. Letting the line out, peel it out, just like I talked about. Let it get to the bottom. We're about 45 feet here, 50. And that rock will come all the way down here. Fish are not very aggressive. We got that high sky today. Yesterday we had that low pressure system. Fishing is going to be just a little bit tougher, I believe. I'm going to shake it now. Pull, shake. Pull. Slowing it down. In the winter time, you want to kind of slow down. Not necessarily your do do do, da 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 da, but the stop and the pull make it a lot slower. Get their attention, but don't be moving the bait too fast. In the summer, when the fish are more aggressive and in late spring, then you can shake it and move it, move it a lot faster. As you can see, this is my other color. It matches those crawdads and night crawlers pretty good. You can see with, with the, everything that I do is natural and everything that I try to do will match the, the, the environment that you're going to fish. The crawdads, the night crawlers, things that the bass are used to eating. And I try to match it as close as possible from the sinker to the worm to, to the noise that the crawdad makes with the glass bead. And it's important and a lot of people think, well, I don't need to use the bead or I don't need to paint a sinker. Well, if you're fishing in deep, clear water and you want to be do doodling the way it should be done, don't change nothing. It's really important not to change anything. If you, if you don't have enough confidence in it, then, then you're going to have to try to do something, that, uh, something else. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to do doodling, you've got to do it exactly the way I tell you and hope that it works for you. For you. If it do, you don't have confidence in it, as you know, nothing works when you don't have confidence. But as you can see, that, that color, that, that, that straight worm of mine, it just about matches those night crawlers pretty good. Matter of fact, as you can see, that, that crawdad wanted a piece of that worm, that plastic worm. He thinks it's a night crawler. 
he's coming after it now. And you can, you can see how natural that looks down there. The tail will come up now if you just hold it like so. Doodling will work 12 months a year. Whether it's cold, warm, hot, freezing, it don't matter. Just a matter of changing the action of the worm. In the wintertime, you don't shake as fast as you shake in the summer and the spring. In the spring, you're using paddle tails, and the paddle tails you want to shake a lot. Because as, you can, as you've seen today with the, with the way the crawdads were moving, how their tails move are very, very fast. He ate that new worm of mine. I really like it. You see how that Klein hook penetrated that fish, folks. It did not leave a hole in the fish or a tear, just where it punctured. That's why I like these Gary Klein weapon hooks. See, they, they really, when they, you can see how that hook, that wide gap on that hook, the way it'll engrave in those fish's mouth, especially in deep water, especially when you're fishing with light line. That was great. Thank you, Fishy. Right on cue. I got a 12-foot pull, and when I'm dropping my worm down in the 12-foot of water, it's shaking just like it was up there. Matter of fact, I've got on a ladder and gave myself another 6-foot to make it almost 20, 18 to 20 foot higher, and still do it, and uh, the worm is still shaking. If you look how this slide comes down into the canyon here, you can kind of study that, and it'll go all the way down into the water down into the 40, 45, 50 foot range. It kind of give you an idea that there is a rock pile there. So that is a good spot to fish. If you look to the right, you see a wall. If you look to the left, you see broken rock. But right there is different. It's almost like a, a dike, a handmade dike, but it's really a natural slide. And in this, especially this time of year, or even in a deep summer, fishing at about 35 to 50, and doodle it down just like I just did and caught that fish at 50, that's the type of stuff you want to fish. Normally at Lake Mead when you're grafting, you're not going to see a lot of bass, one or two on a spot. Don't be looking for a lot of fish. And usually if you, when you find one like that, you can almost always catch them, especially when they're about 30 to 50 foot. Uh, what I try to do if I see one or two little scratches on the graft, I'll fish for those fish, especially in the, in the canyons or the rock slides. But I, if I see a whole bunch of stacked up fish and big bees, more than likely, 90% of the time, they're carp because of their scales. Scales on carp, scales on bass, and scales on stripers are all different. So they all show a little bit different on a graft, in my opinion. I can't always tell for sure whether it's a carp or a bass or a striper, but I'm pretty close most of the time. I look for that one or two little scratches that are isolated especially next to some rock. Normally it's always a bass. That's what we've been trying to do today and we're having trouble getting any environment at all because again it is December and I think a lot of the fish that are down there are just so tight to cover you can't even read them on the graph. They're right inside the rocks or sitting in little cracks in that deep water and come out. The one, two fish we just caught were about 40 to 50 feet, maybe a little deeper. But they're not showing too well on the graph but when I find something that I think it looks like a bass on the graft, I'm going to show show you on camera. So we're going to keep doing that till we find some. Okay. If I start seeing a bunch of black marks, I know most of the time it's carp or stripers, depending on what what the mark looks like. Big fat marks are carp. The short ones are usually stripers. A lot of people come to this lake to fish for bass and stripers, and a lot of tournament fishermen especially come here to fish for bass, fish the U.S. Open from back east and all over the country. It's, this lake's got more fame than any lake I know, partially because of the U.S. Open, maybe mostly bringing all the, fish, the, you know, the superstars from back east out here. The one thing that they find it hard to realize is that a lake like this, especially Lake Mead, the deep clear water lake like it is, there's, you know, you, when you're fishing for a tournament in this lake, the best thing for you to remember is to catch five keepers, five 13 inch fish. You can do that, and you've done a good day on Lake Mead. There's big fish in here. I caught a 913 in 1981. 
doodling. But more, more consistently, the best way to, to approach this lake is approach it on the basis of catching five 13-inch fish. This year, for instance, the U.S. Open was one with 24 pounds for four days of fishing. And that's six pounds a day for five fish. $50,000 for five fish a day that, that weighs six pounds a day. And 24 pounds in, divided into 50,000 is about $2,000 a pound. So that's, that's the way you have to look at this lake And I, when you come to fish it. If you're a tournament fisherman or, or just like to fish for bass, uh, it's a lot of fun to fish these finesse techniques. And you can catch big fish too, but you know, look for your five 13 inch fish because the lake is, you know, it is super tough to fish when it gets a lot of pressure. And if you can catch five 13 inch fish, you've done a good job. You're not going to weigh 100 pounds a day in this lake. This is just, and that's what's hard for a lot of people back east to come out here and, and, and understand that these deep clear water lakes in the west are extremely difficult to fish. And if you can catch yourself some keeper fish every day, you've done a good job. Yeah, we might get a fish here. There it is. There he comes. There he comes. Straight up. About 50 foot. What a deep fish that was. Whoa. There he is. Little guy. Little guy. A 12 inch fish. That fish was deep. Sitting right on the edge of this boulder. What I'm doing now is I'm trying to circle this structure with my boat. You don't ever want to go straight across structure when you're grafting. Remember your cone angles round and try to run your boat in a circle the same way. You'll control a lot more bottom, you'll get a lot better detail, and you'll pick up a lot of bottom that you would normally have not picked up by running straight across it. What I'm looking for now is some rough bottom off this slide where I can find a few fish moving. And once I pick up those little scratches, and if I think that those are the type of scratches I want to fish, and that's when I'll fish. As I was telling you, when I grafted something, the right environment that, that I thought that would be conducive to fit, catch some bass that I would show you. Well, I finally found some on this, on this slide area inside a major cut. And if you look at those arrows, you'll see those little scratches. The, the arrows will point to each individual bass and see how tight they are to the bottom. You know, I have told you how cold it was, and the fish, there wasn't much environment. But you can see here, there's a few bass in this cover in the broken rock from the arrow starting at the right, going to your left. One arrow to the right, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one, and the next one. And I think we should be able to catch these fish. And what we're going to do is doodle this whole entire bank at about 48 to 50 feet. And we'll shake it all along, which is about 40 or 50 feet of, of, of bottom there. And we'll see if we can catch these fish. It's been extremely difficult today to try to find the right environment, but we finally did. And I think you can see basically what you have to look for. Too many people look for those big Vs. Those big inverted Vs are not always bass. Most of the time, 90% of the time, they're not. They're carp, stripers, or some other type of fish that's in the lake. But these are bass, and if you can see how they're hanging over cover, you'll see uh, you could really miss that if you're not paying attention. So we're going to fish this now. Let's see what happens. Here he comes. Whoa! Nice fish. You see how fast he come up out of the water? Whoa! Did you catch that? Wasn't that something, folks? Jeez. That fish come out of 45 foot of water, and he come up like a torpedo. Nice keeper fish. How's that, huh? That nice? 45 foot of water. That is nice. And boy, he just come up. Did he ever? Well, we better let him go before he dies. Bye-bye, baby. Come on, baby. Come on. Straight up! Woo! Look at him come. There he comes. There he comes. Where's he at? There he is. Boy, that was a deep fish, folks. Another good fish. I mean a good fish. I've been asked about clear water. People 
come up to me and talk to me about fishing in clear water that they can't they get spooked it just bugs them they can't come out and they said the water you know they just they can see 20 foot they just put their rods in the locker and go home well what I've tried to do in this tape is tell people how they can fish this clear water the type of baits they can use to catch these fish the technique and how I go about studying the structure and how I place myself in a position to fish this structure the type of sinkers I use, the type of line, the type of rods, the worms I use, the depths I fish. If you study that and put away all your other thinking, I, I don't have no magic in what I do. I just work hard at it. It's a little different than most people's fishing. A lot of people are starting to do what I do. They do different variations of it. So when you come to these deep clear water lakes, wherever you go all over the country, and we've been doing this on Lake Mead, is try these things that I've showed you and just go out and fish and practice what I've been trying to teach. And I think you'll be surprised in the way you can catch fish. And this will just open the door for a whole new world of fishing for you. And no longer do you have to just concentrate on certain types of water and certain types of structure to catch fish on. You'll have consonants. It'll make you a better bass fisherman, better all-around bass fisherman. And I think this is what, what, what everybody strives to be. Not just an expert in one thing, you want to try to do everything well. And this is just something that I do extremely well. Again, I'm, I'm no, no magician. I just work hard at these things. And I keep developing new ways of, uh, of, of making it better. And I've showed you a lot of my secrets, a lot of ways that I fish. I didn't hold nothing back in, on this, in this video. And if you just go out and try it wherever you live, I think you'll be really surprised at the fish you can catch. And just don't let people tell you, well, you can't catch big fish on those sissy baits. Well, I've caught 50 fish over 10 pounds in my career on these sissy baits. And on this lake, I caught a 913 in 1981 at 45 foot of water on a sissy bait. These little worms will catch big fish, and especially in clear water and deep clear water. And we're fishing in December, the worst time of year you can fish here, and you see how many fish we've caught. We've brought some uh, new fishermen on, on this trip to help us, and they're, they're going to act as, as a witness to what we've done. None of this has been put on. Everything is real that you've seen. Because I wouldn't have it no other way. We took a chance to come up here because this is what I wanted to do. And it, it's worked out. And what you see is what you get. Thank you. <laughs>